Welcome into another episode of Harmonious at Lunch. We got a fun one teed up for you today. It's a hot topic, controversial topic. We got all the things today. But first, what is Harmonious? What are we doing here and why are you listening? Harmonious is the disruptive business architecture that you haven't heard about that you need to. It is the fundamental way to shift how you look at your business, how you're running your business, and it's the 10 disciplines that are necessary to grow, scale, and thrive in your business without pulling your hair out. One of those disciplines, the R in Harmonious, is risk and defense. We're going to dive in there today, a topic we don't deal a lot with on this show and in the inner circle, but it's a very important topic. So I'm excited for this. We got an expert today on AI. That is the controversial topic. Everyone's an AI expert, and everyone's also 17 who's an AI expert. Well, we have someone who's been doing this a long time, and I'm super excited to dive in. So first and foremost, Peter, welcome to Harmonious at Lunch. Thank you for the invitation, and thank you for having me. Yeah, this is going to be fun. So let's let's start with, you know, I called out the 17-year-olds who, who call themselves, quote-unquote, experts. Uh, you are not 17, at least I don't think. But you've been doing this a long time. Can you give us a little bit of your history with AI and how long you've been doing this? Yeah, the, the first AI algorithm that I came about was in the uh, late 80s. And that first algorithm that I used in my programming was in the early 90s. So I have over 30 years of experiences with artificial intelligence. Yeah, that's awesome. So Peter is an OG in the AI industry. Um, I personally didn't even know AI was around that long. And uh, so this is this is interesting to me. So let's fast forward to today. It's really cool that you've been doing this for so long. You obviously have built up a, a wealth of knowledge over your career. But let's talk about the AI of today, right? I think we're dealing with a totally different model. We have these large language models that everybody's familiar with. Um, who, who? What are the types of companies that you work with today to help them implement AI? Yeah, first, I would like to say that uh, we're not dealing with totally new models. All models are old and were known since the 80s. Hmm. Uh, what we are dealing with is much uh, more processing power. I would like to stress then in e AI, we have uh, two really important factors. One is the input data. And because of the internet, we have now much more input data than we used to have uh, in the 90s. Uh, and uh, because of the processing power, we have a lot of processing power unimaginable in the 90s. Or the supercomputers had um, less computing power than iPhone 15 now. So these are old, old stuff. Only implementation, what you are using it for, is new. That's interesting. All right. Well, I appreciate you taking me to school there because I, I had no idea. I thought all of this, the, the large models and everything was new, but thank you for shedding light on what's changed and how it's changed. So using the current technology with the computing speed and power that we have, um, I know you work with larger companies, but what? give me a sense of what you do with them to help them harness and implement AI and leverage that for their success. So large companies are risk uh, aware and they have usually risk uh, management department or at least officer that is in charge of risk management. So my job is to have a risk manager be prepared for the new re uh, risks that arrive by utilizing artificial intelligence either directly in the company or their suppliers are using artificial intelligence or their buyers are using artificial intelligence because the company is exposed all, also to the AI related risks of suppliers and buyers. So my job is to mid size and larger companies to make them aware of all these risks. And of course, um, the most important thing is how to avoid certain risk, uh, how to uh, accept risk because some risks are unavoidable uh, and we need to accept them and if possible how to transfer that risks we can transfer it hour to our uh, subcontractors or we can transfer the risks by uh, insuring it okay so this is interesting so uh, the r in harmonious like i said risk and defense rad it's an area that i think is super prevalent with ai and any new technology you need to manage manage the risk. And, and like Peter said, so you said, accept, 
transfer, and avoid risk. Can we dive in? Let's start with accepting in terms of AI. What are the what are the risks that we should be accepting when we're implementing AI in our businesses? Uh, we need to understand that AI right now um, is still so the app apps that are available are developing, and um, until you until the model is fully trained, it's not full uh, fully reliable. So it's important that we understand the risks that the results will not be the desired results. Hmm. And also there's a risk that we will need to train this language model, for example, for six months or even 12 months before it starts bearing fruits for you. For example, my uh, I, I'm extremely dyslectic and I write a lot of articles. And my AI software, I, I, I can't tell you the, the name, but um, is uh, it needed 36 months to become uh, useful and 48 months before it uh, completely understood my uh, writing style and it's now fully supporting me. Hmm. And before that, it was just, um, if you imagine um, autocorrect function, <laughs> it was just uh, really uh, painful uh, to bear this first 36 months be be because most of the suggestions were a complete disaster. <laughs> that's that's interesting. Also very unfortunate, but that's quite the investment to get a usable product. So is yeah. that, and I know I've heard the stories with, um, and full disclosure here for you, the listener, you know, I'm not an AI expert, so don't judge me. Okay. But that's why Peter's here. And that's why I'm asking him these questions. Um, but I've heard the stories, chat GPT, Bard, you know, they're making things up from, from pulling, pulling false information from the internet and giving it to you. And then you, if you use that, you actually, I guess that would be an example of accepting risk. You may be misquoting or using bad statistics because you're using yeah, these that, models. That is Misquoting is uh, smaller of uh, many risks. One right. of uh, much more um, severe risk and with the severe consequences is using art, other people's uh, intellectual property, mm. like uh, not just quotes, but formulas and um, yeah. plans. And you, you, you some, some people believe that the plan was written by chat GPT or devised but it was actually uh, stolen, not stolen, but uh, chat GPT picked it on the internet and just um, recycling that give it to you. And the whole procedure that was devised by chat GPT uh, could all already be patented somewhere. And that is a huge problem with chat GPT. It's same with uh, different sentences. It's same with different pictures. Um, there is not, in, as, as we speak, they are developing that. I, I, I'm aware of that. Um, there is not this intellectual prop property right uh, disclaimers and uh, you don't have full traceability. The biggest challenge with neural networks is that um, because they change so often, like 100,000 times in offer to get the, the, the biggest result, you don't have the full trace uh, to the origin. And that is something that legislation in U.S., and EU is working on that uh, every provider of uh, apps would have to uh, secure the traceability and also take care of the intellectual property rights that they might be bridging. That's really interesting because what I'm thinking is, you know, let's let's take this personal here. Harmonious that is proprietary to what if it is trademarked. But if you were to go into ChatGPT or, or any of these uh, software tools and ask for a unique business model, who knows, maybe it pulls that because we've published it on, on the internet. Mm -hmm. Is there a way for me as the, the trademark holder, the patent holder to protect from AI stealing intellectual property? Or is there really yes. nothing that can be done at this point? No, no. Um, there is... Uh... For example, Google as one of the biggest uh, ha have already devised uh, in their search that AI derived uh, content is indexed as AI derived and as such it, it goes additional scrutiny. So there is there are tools in place that can help you check your intellectual property rights. And then based on uh, your decision, you can 
so there are different strategies how to go about uh, intellectual property theft or bridging. Uh, you can either uh, send them cease and desist or a letter and they have to stop immediately or they you just let them use, you go to your um, lawyer and the, let them use for three or four years and then uh, said, okay, you, you made 100 million with, with, with my uh, content, so I want 25 million of that. So I like that fun. route. That one sounds pretty good too. <laughs> yeah, oh, so, so it's, it's just, especially if, for example, a bigger company would use yeah. your brand and you know that they could make like a billion out of it. Let's say that they would use it as a, a AI app, uh, how to do business models and they would use your model. And you know that uh, for sure, you just make, let them make first billion and then pay us hundred million and you say, okay, thank you. Okay. So that's, that's another risk reward conversation. Yeah. We yes. might let that happen. That sounds like a good, a good opportunity, but no, I, on, in all seriousness, it's, it's important to know that you can take steps to protect yourself, protect your IP and your data uh, when using AI. So that's good. But then let's, so let's transition a little bit. You said mitigate was was something else talk to me what does that mean when you are mitigating risks when you're using ai in your company so uh there are always uh, three ways to mitigate risks one is to completely avoid them so you see a uh, company can have a policy we will not use artificial intelligence related apps but this is almost impossible right now because even your navigation device has some ai inside so you, you you should go back to the Stone Age, probably. <laughs> <laughs> if, Good if advice. You want to completely avoid. So it's important to understand what risks are that. So accepting risk, um, make some reservation, so money, uh, if this risk materializes and one of your employees or suppliers uh, breach some intellectual property, right? And so, so that you have some money on the side that you can cover that and settle the, the, the things if it happens. And of course, you can also uh, transfer the risks either to your suppliers and have a clause in every contract that, uh, about artificial intelligence risks, or you can even insure yourself against uh, that risks. So um, as, as I mentioned, there are three strategies or three ways to, to go about every risk, either completely avoid it uh, that is seldom possible. Uh, accept it. That is uh, possible. But accepting risk also means that you have to have additional funds available for if the risk uh, materializes, then you will have to pay up or you can transfer the risk either to your um, suppliers or your buyers or with the disclaimers. And of course, you can transfer the risks uh, by insuring it. I, I would also like to state that uh, you, uh, EU has already uh, prepared legislation about artificial intelligence risks, and you cannot transfer all the risks to your suppliers and buyers and all this stuff. So you cannot just say uh, it's your fault if something goes wrong. That is not acceptable anymore. Uh, that's that's good to know. And that's these are the things that we talk about in the R module, the RAD risk and defense uh, discipline within the architecture. There, this this topic, AI, artificial intelligence, there's a lot of authentic stupid in going on in the world. There are a lot of people that are just using this because they don't fully grasp what it is and they're using it for bad. They're using it uh, ignorantly and they're getting themselves in trouble. So you as an entrepreneur, as a small business owner, this is all stuff you need to consider, especially when you're diving into this newer area for you in your business. So Peter, before we wrap up here, um, a couple of things I want to highlight. First and foremost, I want to put your website on the screen. If if you want to dive into AI, you should probably manage your risks and learn from somebody who's been there, done that, and been doing it for a long time. So reach out to Peter. Um, but also give me some, maybe some ways that, that small business owners and entrepreneurs can look at AI and what's what's the opportunity out there to really dive in and, and help implement this in our businesses? Okay, first, let's start on the uh, wrong end with the risk and how to mitigate most of the risks in a small company. Everything that is done by AI have a human uh, check it, do the double check. So it's 
you you will notice like 99% of the faults if uh, a person experienced person from the company checks everything it's it's like when you have a new guy coming in to work for you you have to supervise him and check everything so until you are 100% certain that your ai app is doing it as you want um, double check everything that is um, on a, on the flip side but there are huge opportunities and there are three main uh, areas where you can implement it for so it's optimization that you have your process uh, run more smoothly you increase your throughput and uh, you eliminate bottlenecks with artificial intelligence the second one is uh, automatization so things that someone need to click now or check it or put the number in could now be fully automated and the third that everyone is afraid of but it's not uh, that dangerous is outsourcing so the simple task can be outsourced to your artificial intelligence apps and uh, as i said double check everything uh, especially when you start when you're certain you can um let, let's say you, you can lose your control but for six months nine months double check everything yeah that's that's great advice i know i've used chat gpt and bard and i've i've copy and pasted in a rush and and i've been on can, the losing end of that that battle yeah. one more thing um, machine learning is a thing when you use chat gpt everyone will have your knowledge so if you don't want to share your know-how with everyone in the net everyone using chat gpt don't put things in your in in chat gpt that are proprietary for your business especially if you have unique point of sale if you have unique technology do not mix it with chat gpt because it will become available to everyone there is a company that produces chips where engineers have put all the chips in, 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 in the chat GPT and now chat GPT knows all the details about that chips. So whoever wants to call it um, and to check because they wanted to optimize it. So the intention was good, but the result was horrible. And so be really um, pay close attention to what you, you are sharing. I worked for a legal office, I, I can't say the name, that is specializing in m and And um, they wanted to use a Canadian software for AI that is meant for um, legal offices. And uh, they decided not to because I advise against it. Because all their tricks of the trade would be picked up by the software and then distributed to all legal offices that are using the same software. So that is a huge risk. If you want, if you want to have an edge, don't lose your edge with artificial intelligence. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I haven't heard that, but that goes back to what we were talking about before with the proprietary info, the IP. Um, that's really good to know, and definitely think about that. Think twice before you put things mm -hmm. into this AI and you use it for your company. So let's real quick, we're going to tie this to a harmonious architecture because we just touched on a few more disciplines that we need to talk about. Um, and then we're going to wrap up. Peter has a really, really cool offer for you if you want to learn how to use AI and implement that in your business. So we talked about RAD. We talked about risk and defense. I don't need to talk about that anymore. Uh, something Peter mentioned, though, was operate. Uh, the harmonious discipline of operate, your, your SOPs, how you get things done, your processes. Um, we always say, make sure when you try to streamline something, you try to automate something, you try to outsource something, you are not in conflict with your value chain as a company. That is so important, especially with AI. If you're making your customers do more work on the front end, whether that's a chat bot on your website or filling out forms before they start working with you, just because you've impl implemented AI and you make your internal process easier and you streamline your bottlenecks doesn't mean you're not pissing off your customers. So be really, really careful before you dive into automation of any kind that you're not breaking your value chain and your brand promise. Now, I do want to ask Peter real quick before we wrap up, you have a, an amazing offer and thank you for even bringing this to, to the audience here. Um, but you have a course on AI that you've done and you're offering it to the audience at no cost with a special code. Can you tell me a little bit about that course? Yeah, the course is on risk management 
and inherited risks uh, that AI brings in the company. I think everyone should uh, take this course. Uh, it's on Udemy. It's a short course, it's an hour, uh, but you will get first a bit of the history because most people think that AI started in uh, last year, but it actually started in the novels uh, more than 100 years ago. And then in the 1956, uh, it was declared scientific discipline. And then there are a lot of part of, uh, so branches of AI that are not called AI anymore. For example, character recognition on your scanner that can make uh, uh, text out of picture. It's not a considered to be AI anymore because it's too trivial. Everyone can do it. But in the 80s, um, character recognition software, that was wow. <laughs> So uh, things change and something that is called AI now might not, not be called AI in uh, like two years or five years, de depending on the development. Uh, all these language models, they might go out if, if things start developing too fast. Um, and um, I, I would like listeners uh, to know that I'm pro artificial intelligence and I would encourage everyone go and first learn as much as possible about it and don't be afraid to hire a consultant an hour of consultancy can open your eyes and don't hire a consultant and sell one uh, particular uh, software because that is not a consultant he's a salesperson <laughs> and uh, <laughs> be really skeptical about it learn about the risks uh, there, my, there's my course about AI risk, and there are other courses on, on that on that topic. Um, do, do not be afraid of, of doing that. Get as much as much information as possible, and then start implementing it conservatively. Do not. So there are key processes or core processes in the company. Do not start with the core processes. Always start with the process that if something goes wrong that uh, you can somehow mend it and uh, improve it in the future and do not fully automate the whole value chain at once just go step by step this will this will make it much safer for you and uh, you don't want to lose your business because um some chatbot did something wrong <laughs> Yeah, you definitely don't want to get in that situation. So this was this was an insightful conversation. I learned a lot about from the risk perspective of AI. And everything you said is is in line with everything we say, right? You know, go small, go slow, and don't don't be stupid and tackle the biggest thing your company solves with AI. And that's very good advice. So if you want to prevent losing thousands, tens of thousands, millions of dollars, go take Peter's course, wherever you're watching or listening to this, it's in the show notes. It's on Udemy, like he said, and there will be a coupon code attached with that. So you can take it for free um, for the month of January, I believe you said. So um, Peter, thank you again so much for being here. This was really, really great episode. Um, and thank you for watching and listening another episode of Harmonious at Lunch. I appreciate your support. Make sure you hit that subscribe button, like, comment, give us feedback. Let Peter know what you think, your questions. I'll make sure to get it to him so we can get your questions answered. And we'll see you on the next episode of Harmonious at Lunch. See you there.